Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Rodney Gillette Jr. Good afternoon, everybody. Oh, this is a good mic. Where's the clicker? Right there on the podium. On the podium. I'm a thousand miles from comfort. I have traveled land and sea. And as long as I am with you, there's no place I'd rather be. All right, sound good. Fantastic. <laughs> Forward. Oh, it's been doing it. Okay, awesome. So, thank you everybody for coming. Uh, my name is Rodney Galletta. I'm a cybersecurity um, consultant with the Pikes Peak SBDC, and I appreciate you all being here. This is an important class. Uh, I wrote this class. It's called Cybersecurity Simplified, What Your Small Business Needs to Know, and You Need to Know It. Uh, a lot of people don't know it, and they're putting my information and your information at risk. Not mine so much, because I know what to look for, so I don't let them do any business with me. Um, I am a certified ethical hacker. Yes, that's a real thing. It's a approximately $900 exam. Um, I was highly motivated to pass it on the first go, and I did. Um, I'm a certified network defense architect, certified chief information security officer. I took that training. It was a little more money, but I took that through uh, Dr. Sean Murray. If you haven't met him, you should. Uh, I own Firma IT Solutions. Um, this is my eighth year in business. Uh, do we have any uh, military veterans out here in the audience? Yeah, all right, thank you. For our veterans, can we give a hand for our veterans, please? Thank you, thank you. Funny thing is, freedom isn't free. And it, uh, it's a large sacrifice that people make for that. So I appreciate your service. I'm a veteran-owned business. I was in the Air Force. Um, and uh, started in Key West, Florida. And then my wife got orders to NORAD, and I ended up here and running the business here. So now I run it in two different places. So that's tricky, but it works. And uh, I'd much rather be running my own business. It's pretty great. So um, I have a awesome um, arrangement with Fox 21 News. Got my, got my man over here, Joshua Crabtree. Say hi, Joshua. Yes, it's my account guy at Fox. Uh, been with him since last March, and it's been awesome. So it's, it's been a great platform for me to be able to get the word out about the threats and how to protect yourself yourself from um, these uh, really malicious people out there trying to destroy your business and destroy you. So the topics of discussion, uh, what is a hacker, how are they getting in, uh, how do we keep them out, uh, examples of real world risks, and questions. So please feel free to stop me at any point in this presentation if you have questions. Um, you don't have to wait until the end of anything. I love to answer them as soon as they pop into your head. So what is a hacker? Uh, we have our black hat, hacker. So that is a person who has malicious intent, wants to destroy things, steal things, hurt things, hurt you, hurt your business, put you out of business. Um, they are very skilled in computer technology, usually making them do things that you wouldn't typically use them for in a regular day-to-day -day sense. Uh, a white hat hacker is what I am. So do I know the dark arts of the black hat world? Yes, I study them all the time. But I use my knowledge to help protect you from the bad guys. And because um, prison is not a, a very sexy place for me to go. I don't want to go there. <laughs> There's nothing appealing about prison. Um, so I'd rather use my, my knowledge for good and not evil. A gray hat is somebody who would be your IT director during the daytime. And then at home, they're stealing credit cards or breaking into businesses. So they're, they're, they're on both sides of the fence on this thing. They're operating on both sides. Uh, your suicide hacker. Uh, we have a methodology that we use when we're committing cyber attacks. And one of those methodologies is to, one of the steps in that methodology is to cover your tracks. The suicide hacker is not interested in covering their tracks. They want to go in, destroy, they're not worried about any collateral damage. Uh, those are pretty dangerous folks. Uh, suicide bombers, they all fall on the same thing, suicide hackers. Um, script kitty, an example of this is somebody who would, I don't know, you got two monitors on your desk and they open up Google and they type, how do I hack Facebook? And then they got Facebook on the other side and they're trying to follow the steps. 
<laughs> on what to do. So these people typically don't have the level of training uh, that I have and others in our profession have, but they're still dangerous. You know, you can go on Google and find parts to make uh, bombs from things that you can buy at Lowe's. So you may not have any engineering experience, but you can still find that information and be very dangerous. Uh, cyber terrorists. How many of you remember September 11th? Remember that. So um, I am not that much concerned about somebody flying uh, commercial aircraft into buildings anymore. It's not what keeps me up at night. What keeps me up at night is waking up in the morning and your USAA accounts, your Wells Fargo accounts, your Bank of America accounts are all zero. And nobody knows where your money, knows where your money went. So I print out my statements every month and I keep them in a file drawer in my desk, uh, just in case. I don't know how that's gonna help me if that happens, but that's the type of cyber attack that worries me. Um, I'm sure you've seen, you've been watching you know, football or watching your favorite shows on television and it might be interrupted by like, I don't know, a brief five, seven seconds of pornography or something and it goes back to your regularly scheduled program. And everybody's talking about, oh man, did you see that? That was so crazy. Did you see that thing you saw on TV? It's so crazy. You just saw somebody attempt to test their ability to interrupt your broadcasting. That's what you should have been paying attention to. They're doing things like that with our power grids and everything else and infrastructure. Um, that's a terrorist event on a cyber platform. Um, I had the, the pleasure of serving this country um, uh, in that capacity uh, down at Fort Huachuca at Network Enterprise Technology Command in Sierra Vista, Arizona. I got to see the cyber war up close and it is crazy, we are at war. We've been at war for a while in cyber. These countries are attacking us, and that brings me to the state-sponsored hackers. These are governments. These are your Russia's, your China's, your North Korea's, your Iran, and others. But their governments are paying people with very high-level skill sets. They're training them, and they're telling them, hey, go hack into the United States. Go hack into Britain. Go hack into our friends. Um, very dangerous, and they get paid a lot of money. They're not all wearing hoodies and sitting in dark closets drinking Mountain Dew, that's not what they look like. They're suited up, they go to lunch, they've got payment plans, they get checks, and they run all kinds of automated scripts all day and they come back later and they see a whole list of all the computers they can compromise. Uh, that's the state sponsor. Hacktivist is, I'll go show you, I left it over here. Can you hand me that, Wandrika, the gold thing? Yes. yes. Thank you. So this is an example of a hacktivist. This mass represents a real world hacktivist organization called Anonymous. And depending on what side of the bed they wake up in the morning depends on what they do. It's leaderless. There's no leader of it. It's just a bunch of really smart people doing whatever they feel like. So they might feel like uh, ISIS shouldn't be posting recruiting videos on the internet. So they will go after them in any way possible, They're usually highly effective, and keep ISIS from putting videos on the web. Or they may get mad about a movie that a, a, a movie studio released and end up hacking the Sony PlayStation Network and shutting it down for a month. You know, I'm, I'm a gamer and Mortal Kombat had just been released for the PlayStation 4, and the day it was released, the PlayStation Network was shut down for a month. Every single user's information was compromised because this group went in and disrupted the service because they didn't like a movie that was released. It's some movie about um, the assassination of uh, the leader of North Korea. It was a comedy. It was all right. But anyway, that's a hacktivist organization. Uh, there's a TV show called Mr. Robot. I don't know if you've seen it. Um, it's on Amazon Prime. It's really, really good. Uh, there's a hacktivist organization in it called F Society. And I used to have that mask, but I ran over it in my truck by accident. Uh, but those are the players. Are there any questions on this slide? All right, cool. Let's move on. Cybersecurity fundamentals. We break down cybersecurity into three fundamental components. Availability, integrity, and confidentiality. The availability is when you come into work and you get on your computer, can you access your data? Is it there? Is it available? That's your availability. One of the components of availability that people don't think of is your backups. So if you walk in one day and your computer has crashed, can you bring it back? One of the things I ask potential new clients, I ask them, I say, hey, if we're talking right now, if your computer crashed right now while we're talking, can you bring your data back? And you'd be surprised how many people be like, uh, well, I'm not sure, I haven't thought of that. I'm like, yes, you might have some problems there with your availability. Uh, integrity. 
Is your data changing because you wanted it to change or somebody unauthorized changed it? Many of you have CRMs, customer relation um, management systems with all your clients' names and addresses and information in it. So you come in one day to work and half of that's gone. Somebody has compromised the integrity of your database that wasn't supposed to do that. Confidentiality is keeping your stuff secret so that nobody sees it except the ones that are authorized to see it. How many of you heard of Edward Snowden? You heard of that guy? Yeah, interesting guy. So uh, he compromised the integrity, the confidentiality of a lot of precious data that our government was keeping. Um, don't get it twisted. We are looking into other people just like they're looking at us. And when you're at that high level of security, there's some things you just gotta keep quiet. I've seen things that were unnerving, but I gotta keep them quiet. That was my job, that's my service to my country. Um, so in a lot of cases, there's a 46% chance that I could take a USB drive, drop it into one of your offices, and one of your people will pick it up and be like, oh, that's cool, and stick it in the computer. You do that, now I own your network. Um, that compromises the confidentiality of your systems. It'll also compromise the integrity of your system. So think about it, next time you're out somewhere, if you can plug a USB drive into a computer at a business and see if it goes doo-doo <laughs> and it, it works. It's not good. You can turn those USB drives off in a secure environment. Are there any questions about the fundamentals of cybersecurity in those three bullets? Yes, ma'am. Recently. Oh yeah. Credit card. Yeah, the integrity and confidentiality of those days that day has been gone. So she's asking about the credit bureaus that have been breached. Absolutely. OPM, you know, Office of Personnel Management. Shoot, I'm in it. Oh, excuse me. Um, that information has been compromised as well. A lot of times, these uh, these breaches happen um, because of things that could have been avoided. You know, now there are hackers using skill sets that are very advanced to try to break into systems, but a lot of times they're looking for low-hanging fruit, something easy to get into, like a, I don't know, a, a network device that has the default username and password on it, and everything else is secure. You got that one door open, I'm in. I've got it. <clears throat> yep, yep, third-party people can get you, and we're gonna talk about that now. How are they getting in? Advanced persistent threats. So I might jump around this list a little bit. So how many of you heard of ransomware? Okay, so those of you who haven't heard, it's an ugly thing when you walk into work and you have an FBI logo on your screen saying all your data is locked up and you can't get it back until you pay us X amount of dollars in some anonymous currency exchange. When it first started, you were able to pay with your credit card. But then people got smart and would call the credit card companies and say, hey, I've been frauded out of like $10,000 and they get their money back. It's great. So now you gotta send it in Bitcoin or some other anonymous currency exchange. It's really difficult. So that's when you know you've been breached, when you have a ransomware attack, because you can't work. Sometimes these hacker criminals, the criminal ones, will be sitting inside your computer while you're working and you won't even know they're there. You might notice a little anomaly. Maybe your computer's slow a little bit. Maybe your internet got a little slower. But they want you to keep working so they can keep collecting information from you. Um, how many of you have been on, how many use Facebook? Okay, so let me give you an example of an advanced persistent threat. Uh, and I'll be talking about that later in the slides too. So you get a post that says, hey, um, what was your first car? <laughs> put them in the post below. And you've got hundreds of people's real names in their first car, okay? So I'm gonna write that down. And then you get another post that says, hey, what was the first place you went for your anniversary? <laughs> put them in the post, put them in the post below. And you got a bunch of people's real names and where they went on their first honeymoon. Now, after a time, I've collected a lot of information on your secret questions to reset your passwords. That's an example of an advanced persistent threat. It's persistent. They're going to keep putting those things out and people are going to keep biting them and giving them the information. And over time, I have a nice um, package to compromise you in a very specific way. Uh, botnets. So imagine if I'm able to put some type of computer virus on a bunch of different computers and then link them all together 
to launch an attack against another place. So in the fall of 2017, we had an incident called the Murai worm, M-U-R-A-I worm. And it affected the Internet of Things, which is like your security cameras, your wireless security cameras, and your smart fridges, smart TVs, and your routers that you've never updated since you purchased them. A virus had been implanted in all those devices. They all got linked together, and they launched an attack against Netflix, Amazon, the Adobe Creative Cloud, and shut them down for a significant amount of time, enough time for it to make national news. That's an example of a botnet causing problems. Cloud computing. Not all clouds are created equal. Sometimes the cloud can get you in trouble. So an example is a company here in Colorado Springs, <clears throat> a law firm, they've got all their data in Dropbox, and they have it linked to seven computers that don't have any security on them. And there's pop-ups on maybe one or two of them. If one of those computers gets compromised, I can access that cloud environment and compromise all the rest. That's an example of the cloud environment putting everything else at risk. Um, insider attacks. With all the technology, we have some really awesome managed service providers in the room. Got SimpleWorks over here. I know Amnet is going to be hosting. Hey, what's up, Trevor? It's going to be hosting the happy hour later. We have some awesome tech at our disposal to keep hackers out of your systems. But it is as simple as me just picking up the phone and calling you and asking you what your password is. You may laugh, but that's how easy it's getting. Or I'll just send you an email. Go through all my stuff, and I'll send you an email and say, hey, go to, uh, and this is a real one, so please don't fall for this. And tell your friends about this scam. Do not go to Walgreens and buy a whole bunch of gift cards and scratch off the back and email them to somebody. Nobody's going to ask you to do that. That's ridiculous. But there are people today still doing that, because they don't know. So that's how people are getting compromised. A best practice for your business, before you terminate an employee, you need to kill their access to your computer systems first. I know it sucks. You need to kill them. Yeah, what's that? I thought you said you're going to need to kill them. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> I thought we don't say we did, but I get you. I get you. Um, yeah, kill their access first before you let them go. Because if you do it the other way around, they still have access to your systems. That's an insider threat right there. Um, mobile threats. How many of you are connected to the Wi-Fi in this hotel right now? It's okay. <laughs> so you're going to be a lot smarter when you leave this conference, but there are people that go out and connect to um, uh, large public wireless networks, and sometimes they're nefarious networks. You go to Starbucks, their Wi-Fi is called Google Starbucks. That's what it's called. But I also have a device in my bag that I can broadcast a wireless network called Google Starbucks. So then when you look at your wireless networks to pick which one to connect to, you'll see two. So. You know, you got a 50% chance to get the right one. You get the wrong one, you connect it to me. So what do I do? I clone a bunch of the most popular websites. I will clone the USAA page. You know, I will clone, you know, T. Rowe Price's page. I will clone this hotel's page. And you'll click the link, and it looks like a good link, and it'll say, hey, download this PDF real quick and read this. It's not a PDF, it's a file. It's going to give me access to your computer. And then you close that computer up, and you take it back to the office, and you open it up. Now I'm on your office network, compromising that. And you close the laptop up, and you take it home. And you sit on your couch and watch Game of Thrones, and you come back online, and I'm in your house. I'm in your house now. So those are the mobile threats. That's how they move. Um, yeah, take a deep breath. <laughs> take a deep breath, yeah. Because I'm working on a, on a good ending to the story. <laughs> But I need you to understand this and take this serious, because I talk to people, I know my colleagues talk to people every day that do not understand this, yeah. right? We got C3 in the house, hey, yeah. what's up? Um, they don't get it. They think it only happens to Target, right? Or it only happens to Home Depot or Forever 21 or Amazon Cloud or Capital One. It doesn't happen to you because you're too small. Nobody wants what you have. That is a bad misconception. They want what you have. And sometimes it's not about you. They can get through you to get to somebody else. How do I hack the largest electronic health record databases? Going straight to them? I could. It's going to be harder. They're going to have defenses. But I'll go to the small private practice here in town that has no passwords on their computers, no encryption. They're all running Windows 10 Home Edition that they bought from Best Buy at you know, the Black Friday sale last year. 
no protection at all. They got a Comcast cable modem with default username password on it. I use that, control one of those computers, and I'm all up in the electronic health record using their credentials. Doesn't even look like a hack. Looks like they're logging in for everyday use. That's how dangerous it is. So let's talk about the types now. Operating systems. How many of you have heard of Windows XP? Okay. Microsoft has not used Windows XP in years. I think we got some Microsoft people here. Are there any Microsoft folks in the room? Okay, I think they're out there in the hall. Um, they don't use it anymore. They decommissioned it. It's called end of life. There are chiropractor offices that I know of today taking your x-rays on Windows XP computers that are connected to the rest of the network with your health records. And they've been told it's dangerous, and they're like, eh, it'll be fine. No, they won't. That's an example. Windows Vista is another one. You shouldn't be using that either. Windows 7, how many of you are using that? Windows 7, heard of Windows 7? All right, January 2020, Windows 7 is no good. They're gonna abandon it just like they did Windows XP and Windows Vista. So if you haven't made a plan to get off Windows 7, it's October 25th, you should start thinking of a plan. The January's coming right around the corner. Misconfiguration. Um, how many of you know what an IP address is? 192.168. I know my tech people. Y'all ain't have to raise your hands. Um, so the the 192.168.1. Whatever, like that. The whole format is called IP version four. And we're running out of those, like we're running out of phone numbers. So there's a new technology that's been implemented a few years ago, but it's not everywhere yet. Called IP version six and it's hex decimal. It's zero through nine, A through H, and it's very long, and you're probably not gonna memorize them like you've done these IPv4 addresses. The IPv6, if you're not using it for your networks, turn it off. Most of you aren't using IPv6. There's very high level applications for that protocol, so if you're not using it, turn it off. If it's on and you're not using it, that's an avenue for somebody to get in. And guess what Windows does, every single version? It's on by default. So if you're not a techie, you don't know. You got IPv6 running on all your stuff. Turn it off. If you don't know how to turn it off, Google how do I turn off IPv6 on my computer? And it'll walk you through how to do it. Turn it off today. Application level. Um, Apple QuickTime. So let me, let me go back in history and tell you a story about the time before YouTube. So you were only able to watch movie trailers, and I love movie trailers, on the Apple uh, iTunes, Apple, the Apple website. They had a website for trailers, the Apple trailer site. And they had a technology in that website called QuickTime. It's a video player that's used to play videos. Now, if you have a Mac, it's okay to have this software on your Mac. It's okay. But if you have a Windows computer, it's not okay to have Apple QuickTime on your machine. So I will go home today, or go to your business, look through your program list, and see if you have Apple QuickTime installed. If you do, you need to remove it. If you want to know why, you can Google US cert Apple QuickTime. And that whole first page, second page, third page, fourth page, is going to be all the warnings about why this should not be on your Windows computer. It is proven to be a gateway for somebody to remote access into your computer. Apple has stopped updating that software for Windows years ago. But I still run into organizations, ones that handle your personal information, that have Apple QuickTime installed in their computers. And what's worse, they're paying for IT support. And I didn't see it. So go look for yourself and check that out. Um, defaults, I was talking about that a little bit. So how many of you have Comcast business class for your business? Any Comcast people? Okay, so a trick you can do, the IP address for your cable modem is 10.1.10.1 out of the box. It's typically what it's set at. If you go to that website with your browser, go to that IP address, it's gonna bring up a username and password screen. The username is cussadmin, all lowercase, one word. And the password is high speed, all lowercase, one word. It might be can't touch this. That's a new one they started putting out there. I know this. Everybody knows this. It's on Google. You can find it. And my gripe with them is that they set up these things in businesses without changing that. So I don't know if somebody's recording me right now, but I, I love Comcast. They're great folks, good business. But please have your tech spend five extra minutes and change the password on that cable modem. And something else I would like them to do is allow for symbols to be used in the passwords, because right now it only uses numbers and letters. That's not enough. 
Um, how many of you use CenturyLink? I got CenturyLink here in the hallway too. Where are you guys at? CenturyLink? CenturyLink? What's up, CenturyLink? So here's my thing with CenturyLink. And I like CenturyLink. The modems that they give out have a sticker on the bottom that has a username and password to the modem. And it's, it's a beautiful password. It's nice and cryptic. It's got the password to the Wi-Fi. It's nice and cryptic. It's got this admin code on the bottom. It's on the bottom. When they set it up, people don't change those. So I've been in businesses that handle your personal information, FERPA information, HIPAA information. I'll go use the restroom, and I'll walk by a closet by the bathroom with their modem in it. I just flip it up, take a picture, use the restroom, wash my hands. I'll go outside and sit in the parking lot, and I can get into the whole system from outside. And they've never changed the passwords on them. So, Default username passwords are dangerous. You have um, network printers, printers that print wirelessly or you plug them into your network. They also have default usernames and passwords on them. They are also vectors for somebody to hack into your computers, your printers, okay? So anything that has a default username and password on it, change it when you buy it. Please change it. Defaults are dangerous. Any questions on this slide? Yeah, yes. I, I missed the bottom of the vectors where it says viruses, worms. What's the difference with all that stuff? So like I'm going to call all that malware. Okay? It's just bad software on your computers. Ransomware is the one that makes you pay money to get your data back. I want to speak on worms, though. So worms are more like a feature of a virus. They all have like different features, things that they do. The thing about a worm is that it's able to copy itself it copies itself, and it does a scan over your entire network and finds places for it to copy itself to. So it's very dangerous. Ransomware has a worm component, every single version of it. So if it hits one computer, it's going to search the network and hit every computer it finds. If you have like a backup server in another building and it's on that same network, it's going to find that, encrypt all that too. So that's why it's really important to have some type of data backup mechanism that's cloud-based because all your local stuff is gonna get hit with a ransomware attack, all of it. All of it. Did I answer your question? Yeah, I'm just learning today, but yeah. Awesome. <laughs> yes, sir. I just wanted to pile on uh, what you were saying about V6. If you're not using, I mean, I love V6. If you're using it, it's great, but if you're not using it, as you said, turn it off. Mm -hmm. It's on by default in Linux, it's on by default in, in Mac OS, and most important thing for everybody to know is it's not filtered by most firewalls. Mm -hmm. It just flies through your firewall. Before we all have, you know, we all have filters set up, and, and firewalls by default understand how to manage IPv4 packets, but they don't necessarily know how to manage IPv6, so they just let it fly through your network. And if it happens to be open, you're vulnerable. You're, so you're exactly right. Yep. Thank you, sir. Appreciate that extra. Appreciate that. Are there any other questions before I move on to the next slide? All right. Cool. It's going to get better. So here's some numbers for you. Uh, in 2015, 43% of cyber attacks were hitting small businesses. 2016, it was 53%. 2017, it's 61%. The Verizon Data Breach Investigation Report for 2019 came out in April of this year. And they said that 43% of cyber attacks are targeting small businesses. Sure. Those numbers are misleading because in the 2018 report, they took healthcare out of that number. So healthcare has been put in its own little category, and healthcare is under fire. So that percentage number is actually higher now. Yes, sir? From a cybersecurity standpoint, what's the criteria defining what a small business is? So the SBA, I believe, defines a small business as 500 employees or less. Is that correct? Any SBA people in here can verify that? Where's Eric Phillips at? In the hallway? In general, however, it depends on each industry. Sure. Yeah. So Amazon is probably not a small business, but your accountant, your lawyer, your dentist, you know, all of us that provide the services, like we're, we're all small businesses. I think everybody in here, for, for the most part, small business. Yes, what's going on, DeAndre? Robert, what was there a small drop between 12 and 13? People getting smarter? More people coming to these classes? You know, I think one of the, the biggest things on that graph is the big jump from 2011 to 2012. Outside of my tech people, uh, anybody know why that jump was there? So that's when ransomware reared its ugly head to the world. Started seeing a whole lot of that. You had a question back there, brother? 
Huh? No? Oh, okay. Um, so those are the numbers. Here's the facts. 43% of cyber attacks target small businesses. Only 14% of small businesses rate their ability to mitigate cyber risk vulnerabilities and attacks as highly effective. Only 14% of businesses think they're doing what they need to do to take care of their data. 14%. 60% of small companies go out of business within six months of a cyber attack. And it ain't just a cyber attack that does it. I was having a consult. Tammy, we're talking back there earlier. So one of the things that hurts people is your clients are going to sue you. <clears throat> because when you get breached, you're going to be asked a lot of questions. And one of the questions they're going to ask you is, what were you doing to keep this from happening? And if your response is, well, I had my office manager managing our IT security, is your office manager trained in any of this? No. OK. Or I had my mother's brother's sister cousin boyfriend doing our IT for the hookup. Or we had the son of a board member taking care of our IT for the hookup for free. So we don't have to pay for it. That's a problem. And the court of public opinion is going to crucify you for that. There's a little thing called Colorado House Bill 1128. If you haven't read it, you should. There's a booth out there that has it printed out uh, on their table. That's Colorado's data privacy law. Every state has different ones. That's ours, 1128. You should check it out. You have an obligation to let the state know that you have been breached or may have been breached within 30 days. If you don't do it, there are going to be problems with that too. Uh, depending on what industry you're in, you have regulatory authorities that also may impose fines for your negligence. One of the most ones that people know of is HIPAA for all you medical industry folks. I have seen medical industry <laughs> companies here in town that are at level four. So there's levels of HIPAA violations. Level four is like $50,000 per record in prison time for willful neglect of your data. So after I come and do a cyber assessment on your business, and I tell you you have all these problems, and you ignore what I wrote you, and you get breached, that's a level four, buddy. That's willful neglect. You willfully chose not to do anything about it. And I know a whole bunch of willfully neglectful companies out here in Colorado Springs. A whole bunch. They'd rather not pay. They'd rather hope that it's going to be okay. And I'm going to tell you about hope in a minute. 48% <laughs> of data security breaches are caused by acts of malicious intent. Human error or system failure account for the rest. That's real stuff. The big numbers, one in 10 URLs, that's your website addresses, are malicious. It's not always going to you know, download you know, the latest movie that's still in theaters. You'll get hit with that, but that's not always the place where you get it. It's not always about looking at adult content online. You'll get hit with that, but there's other places you're doing innocuous web browsing, you're just doing your job. One of those websites has something nasty on the back end. You'll get a pop-up with a siren going off saying, your computer's been infected, call Microsoft right away, 1-866-something. Microsoft will never have an error on your computer with a phone number, ever, <laughs> ever. They don't do that. And Microsoft will never call you on the phone to tell you that your computer's messed up. An unsolicited phone call from somebody telling you your computer's messed up and need access to your machine right away is bad. If you want to have fun with them, please go ahead and do that. I do that every time they call me. You're like, yeah, open up your browser. Like, well, you know, I typed it in, but it says recycle bin. Like, no, don't go to recycle bin. Go to Internet Explorer and type in this website. I just make them real piss off. I make them really mad. Um, but that's keeping them on the phone, keeping them calling one of y'all, and they might get you. And they might get your parents or somebody else. But I, I do have a good time with them. Um, website attacks are up 56%. People are attacking websites. There are people that tell me, Rodney, you know, how many of you have been to websites and you've seen that little lock in the corner? OK, that lock is important. That means there's something called a SSL certificate encrypting that website's content. So it's protecting you looking at the site and it's protecting the site from you. <clears throat> if you go to a website and they don't have that lock, especially if it's like a tax firm or medical organization, you should have them call the SBDC and talk to a cybersecurity consultant. Appreciate that. Your community would appreciate that. People say, Rodney, we don't have any information that's important on our website, so we don't need the SSL certificate. We just got display information. That's all we got. And that's how all those customers sound in my head. Uh, that's, that's, that's all we need. It's like, well, I can hijack that site since it's not encrypted and replace your links to go somewhere else. That's a problem. Um, average 4,800 websites per month compromised by form jacking. 
Rodney, what in the world is form jacking? You've been to the websites that have like the contact us forms on them. So if that website's not secured, when you type in that information and you hit submit, a third party's intercepting that information before it gets to where it goes, if it gets to where it's supposed to go. That's form jacking, and it's going up a lot. 48% of malicious email attacks use Microsoft Office documents. I've been to businesses that are using like Microsoft Office 97. I don't even know how to get it to work. <laughs> like it's so old. Um, Microsoft Office 2010, I think, is the, the oldest supported version that they have right now. Am I right with my MSP folks in here? Office 2010. Uh, I wouldn't be using Office 2010. They've got more recent stuff. You should use that because they are able to send viruses through those documents. Now, if you are technical and you want to show yourself something cool, take the last Microsoft Word document, has the DOCX at the end of it, and take the DOCX off and type zip and let it change it to a zip file and then open it and see like every Word document is like a mini website. All those Office documents are like mini websites. So I can actually put a malicious document in there, hide it, and then change it back to docx and then send it. And your firewall won't see it, none of your security will see it, but you'll know because I told you, hey, there's a little secret document embedded in this Word document. It'll be a blank document, but there's files in there. And some of those files execute as soon as you open the document. That's how those hacks are happening. Ransomware is up 12% for business, down 20% overall. They're changing their focus. They're coming after small businesses. They're coming after medical. Especially all the people that have like personal information that they, they transmit and deal with on a daily basis. It's very dangerous ransomware. You don't want to get it and it's avoidable. You don't have to get it. You don't have to get it. Um, PowerShell scripted attacks up 1,000%. Now, PowerShell. I don't know how many of you have been using computers for a while, but there was this thing called DOS back in the day. It was a black screen, white text, and you typed and did everything with command line. So a version of that is still available in Windows, but they have moved <clears throat> to an even more powerful platform called PowerShell. You can run your whole Windows environment with this, with just command line. You don't even need the mouse or anything anymore. So these aren't programs, these are lines of code. And all of your computers that are running Windows have PowerShell in them. So if that code is executed, it's not going to see a file get executed. It's not looking for a virus file. It's a piece of code that got executed. And it's going to run something on your computer. It's going to turn it into some kind of compromised device to either hurt you or somebody else. Yes, ma'am. It seems like in the last six months, maybe, when I have been on the internet, certain links, they just don't respond. Or they are delayed. And I, I, you know, I just thought, maybe my computer is really that slow now, but it just seems odd that in the last six months or maybe a year, I don't know, but it just, there's more times when I have clicked on a live link and nothing is happening. So, I don't know all the software that you have on your computer. Excuse me. But there are defense mechanisms being put in place. Um, Windows Defender is like the free um, security software that comes on Windows computers. But those links get scanned when you click on them. Make sure that nothing's bad behind them. Because sometimes those websites that are hosting those links, they're not secure. So somebody may have gone in and changed that link to something bad that's trying to get you ransomware. So you're clicking it. It's like, why can't I go get tickets at the Cheyenne Mountain Zoo? Why isn't it working? Why is it working? Because it's a ransomware link and it's trying to be stopped. Yeah. It's a good thing. It's possible, yes. Oh, Rodney? Yes. I'll pay more attention. Just to forget about V6. Full disclosure, I actually helped design V6. But if you turn it off, wow, that's the impressive. best reason to turn off V6 is it will speed up your computer. Do it for no other reason. I mean, security is great. If you turn off IPv6, it means that it will not try to connect to an IPv6 address first or try to look it up. It will just use IPv4. So your computer, if for no other reason, go home and do it, and you'll have a faster computer. That's awesome, man. I'm glad you're here. Thank you. Did I answer your question? Yeah. Awesome. Any, any other questions on this slide before I continue? Yes. Your computer may get slow. Should be tracking that. If your mouse isn't fluidly going across your screen when you move it, it's like a get stuck and then goes. Uh, take a look at your task manager and see if there's something running. 
us pulling up the programs to run in the background? It could. It could reach out to, we call them command and control servers. These are like the hackers like repository for like bad things, all, th all things bad. So it'll reach out to that and start downloading stuff into your computer. Or it starts sending stuff out of your computer. Like whatever you're looking at on your screen, your keystrokes, um, or just sending all your data that you're saving, just sending it out every day or in real time. <clears throat> it's hard to see, but the thing is, let me go ahead and set this expectation. Nothing's 100% secure, nothing. But what we're trying to do is keep you from being low hanging fruit. Because that's what the hackers really want to get to. The easy ones, man, there's, there's a lot of them. I know a lot of them by name. Can't tell you who they are. I avoid them. But there's a lot of them down here. They go after these ones first. The ones that are up here, you know, we, we got to decide if we want to go hit those bigger targets. But there's enough easy ones to just have a field day with it. So I don't want you to be the easy pickings. Any questions before I pass on to the next slide? Yes, ma'am. You know, when you set your computer to respond to the updates that are coming in, and, you know, they recommend that you do it automatically, and so you don't know when they're updating, are you recommending that we set that to say, oh, yeah, because I get flash updates once a week. Flash updates? I think it's flash. Okay, so that, that's, that makes sense. So flash is uh, an Adobe systems technology, and every time there's an update to it, that old version has been hacked some kind of way. Oh. And it's usually really bad. So, um, well, if you don't need it, don't you, you can uninstall, uninstall it. Okay, but, but seriously, I've always, I, I have never set my computer to automatically update. Are you recommending that we don't? Depends on what the updates are. So your Windows updates, set those automatic, but go check them once a week, though. I get those all the time as well. I'm thinking yeah. it's that big breach a couple of years ago when they just had to go way back into something. I don't know, can't remember what happened. Seems like I get Windows updates all the time. You should get Windows updates all the time. There's hacks happening all the time. So every time there's like a breach or some kind of vulnerability, Microsoft's going to release a patch. Okay. And they'll keep releasing patches. Okay. Um, and I'm going to talk about updates and stuff in a later slide. But um, check your updates once a week at least. Even if it's set to automatic, check it. Because if it messes up during the updates, it might stop updating. And it won't start again until you go in and manually tell it to retry and do the updates again. I've had that issue before you. Awesome. So, <clears throat> this is a picture of a business in Colorado Springs. And it is a dental office that's been here for a long time. I went to go see them in January of this year and uh, to do a cyber analysis on their business. Um, for those of you that got good eyes or glasses or whatever, can anybody tell me what's wrong with this picture? I went to go see them in January 2019 to do an inspection. <laughs> The updates were last installed January 25th, 2017. So I tell this doctor, it's like, sir, you understand that there's been a lot of cyber attacks between that date and now. He's like, yeah. It's like, okay. Um, are your medical records on the same network here? It's like, oh yeah, we got a, you have a server here? Is that, is that that thing, that box in my office under the desk? It's like, yeah, probably. He's like, um, so I send them the proposal for services, and they tell me, no, we're not interested. So I'm like, all right, look, you guys are under HIPAA regulatory authority. You're looking at the 50 grand per record, $250,000 possibly, maybe some prison time. They're like, yeah, we're, we're not interested. I'm like, okay, let me rephrase this. Your clients are going to sue you when they find out that you've been breached because of this neglect. It's like, yeah, yeah, we're, 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 we'll be fine. I'm like, okay, so the Attorney General of the State of Colorado is going to come have a field day with you, not in a good way, when they find out that you have neglected to do something about this. I'm like, yeah, yeah, we're fine. We, we already pay for IT support. It's the, it's the owner's friend. I'm like, okay. And sometimes you, you can lead a horse to water, but you can't make him drink. I try. And I know my colleagues try. Not only because it, it helps us create jobs, but because it's helping our community stay safer. And it's really hard to get people to understand that. And I'm really glad you're here so you can tell everybody else when you go meet them after this event, this is why you need to invest in having a professional. How many of you are in tax accounting and bookkeeping? Raise your hand. Okay, got one in here. So everybody else is not in that profession. 
So out of everybody else, except for Tammy, how many of you do your own taxes of bookkeeping and accounting? How many of you outsource that? Yeah, I outsource it because I ain't good at it. I'm good at hacking and protecting you from it and doing what I do, what I got my degree in and all my certs in, but I, that's not tax and accounting. I outsource it. So try to put that in your, in your mindset with your board of directors and other people that you work with. If you're not good at it, outsource it once you're able to afford to do it. And you don't know if you're able to afford to do it unless you shop around. So there's going to be a class today about how to shop around for managed IT services, but you need to be looking for that. We all work well as a team. Do what you're good at and stay in your lane. You know, what you're not good at, find somebody else to do it, and you'll be a lot more successful. A lot more successful. Here's another one. So this is a business in the Citadel Mall. I was walking in to get a haircut, and I happened to walk by this place. They had the little gate down, because they weren't open yet, but you could see through it. And I looked at the computer, and I was like, man. So what you're looking at here is Windows XP, okay? You're also looking at the antivirus being out of date, not updated. This is their credit card machine. This is what they're taking your payments on. So I took my card out of my pocket and I slipped it through the gate, never heard from them. But they're still in business, taking your credit cards right now. This is what's out there. So why is your small business a target? Small businesses are not serious about their cybersecurity. You have the information the hackers want. And if you don't, they'll get to it through you. You're content on doing what you have been doing and hope it doesn't happen to you. Ladies and gentlemen, hope is a bad cybersecurity strategy. It's going to let you down every time. Don't use it. It's bad. Be more proactive and intentional about protecting yourself from these attacks. Now, um, there are businesses that you would normally think would need these services, but there's also businesses that you wouldn't typically think. So uh, thanks to my friends at Fox. I have a video we're going to play about a business here making the right decisions. State community report, protecting small businesses. They are often the targets of hackers. In fact, in more than 40%, they are the ones cyber attack. But there are some steps that you can take to avoid being a victim. Ansley Reese is an aesthetician who's always dreamed of owning her own business. Finally, I was like, I need to do it, you know, and so I just took that leap of faith. Just over a year ago, Reese opened a salon with her name over the door. So she wasn't about to let a hacker or a cyber attack take her down. Being a small business owner, that we're more likely to be under attack. Um, than a lot of other bigger companies because these hackers know that the smaller businesses aren't going to be protected. 60% of small businesses go out of business within six months of getting hit with a cyber attack. Rodney Galat is an ethical hacker. He protects businesses from cyber attacks for a living. Because the businesses are not the only ones putting uh, themselves at risk, but all the people in our great Colorado Springs community that go do business with these businesses, their information is being put at risk. Galat helped install a separate router at Reese's salon, providing wireless Wi-Fi for customers while protecting her computer and records. A little protection that goes a long way. I can't afford not to protect myself and protect my business and protect my customers. Thank you so much. Now next month, Pikes Peak Small Business Development Center will offer a cybersecurity summit for small businesses on October 26th. The cost is just 20 bucks to attend. More info is at sbdc.org. We'll get that on our website. Of course, for more information on how to protect you and your business from hackers, go to our website, fox21news.com. How many of you heard of cyber liability insurance? All right. So if you haven't heard of it, you're going to hear about it today. I think uh, Six and Giving is here. Uh, Melanie Clay is going to be talking about it. Um, you should get it. Invest in well-qualified managed IT and cyber services. Um, let me tell you about this as well. There are a lot of people, a lot of companies out there that are in business doing what I do, but they shouldn't be. They don't know what they're doing. And unfortunately, a lot of times you folks as the consumers don't know the difference between a good managed IT service provider and one that is full of it. And it's tough, so make sure you check out that presentation today on that subject. Um, I've seen providers that, you know, contracts is a big thing. Make sure you read your contracts. Do not let a managed IT service provider into your computer systems without a contract. 
There are some that have like handshake agreements. So yeah, I'm gonna remote access all of your computers, have access to all your data for on a handshake and pay me cash. They don't do that. We have very powerful technology at our disposal. It's pretty much the same technology hackers are using to destroy you. But we use it to help manage your systems and protect you. You should not give that authority and that power to somebody or a company that is not worthy and well qualified. Check on the BBB, see if they're accredited. Call your friends that may be using a service like that. How are you, who are you using? How is that going? You got some good ones in here. You got four good ones in here today. Raise your hand, my, my managed service provider people in here. So they're in here. Come talk to them. Um, education, you're here doing it. Knowledge is power. Hashtag that and share it everywhere you can. Knowledge is power. That's the number one defense, in my opinion, my professional opinion, against a cyber threat, is having knowledge about it and how to protect yourself from it. And speak with an expert. Call and get a consult with us. Where's the rest of my cyber team for SBDC? We're here for free to talk to you. You call us outside, it's gonna cost you a little bit per hour, but you know, here, it's free. Take advantage of that. So passwords. That one at the top there, is that a good password or a bad password? What do you think? <laughs> good, bad, don't know, don't worry about it. I'll classify this as a bad one, I'm not impressed with this one. So, passphrases are good for your passwords. So you wanna say, I love, the SBDC and Rodney's presentation was dope. <laughs> Type that with the punctuation, put the period at the end, capitalize the first letter, capitalize the first letter in my name. That's a good password. It's good. It's a passphrase. It's a sentence. No dictionary words by themselves, not even in different languages. Don't do that, and I'll tell you why later. No words turned into symbols. Don't do that. I'm going to tell you why later. Change your passwords every 90 days. If you want to change it every 60 days or 30 days, that's great. But every 90 days should be your standard. And I'm going to tell you why in a minute. Multi-factor authentication. How many of you know what multi-factor authentication is? Show of hands. Okay, great. So most websites you go to ask you for a username and password. It's typical. It's what you know. There's another factor authentication called what you have. I have an Apple iPhone X. So when I go to my GoDaddy account and I type in my username and password, it sends me a code to my phone. I have to put the code in. That's something I have. That's the second factor of authentication. You should at least have those two on every online account that you have, all of them. Because somebody's gonna compromise your username and password by itself, but it's not as likely that they'll have your phone to get that code. There's a third factor of authentication, which is called something that you are. That's your biometrics. I can look at my phone and it unlocks because it recognizes my face. Um, your speech patterns, your retina scans, thumbprints, all that is something that you are. The cadence that you use when you walk, that's identifiable. Everybody has a different walk. The way you type, it's identifiable with everybody. And there's technology out there to be able to know who you are based on those things. It's coming, we're in 20, 2019 now, it's coming folks. Um, so any online account that you have, needs to have multi-factor authentication turned on. Every online account that you have needs to have a different password. Every single one. Lie on your secret questions. Me and Tammy were talking about this in our consulting session. Um, you'll, I was telling you about the Facebook questions for the advanced persistent threat. I'll find those things out about you for your secret questions. I'll find out what your dog's name is because if you didn't post about it online, somebody else did. I'll find out. I'll take my time and find out. Um, use a long string of like letters, numbers, symbols as the answers to your secret questions. How do you remember? How do you remember? What a natural, organic question. You use a password safe program. Something like lastpass.com. Lastpass.com. That's what I use. I love it. There's others. Dashlane's another, Password Keeper's another. There's a few of them. But the, the intent is, there's one password that you remember, the most complicated one you can commit to memory. Don't forget it. And behind that will be all the passwords, secret questions, all that stuff that you need. I like LastPass because I looked at their About page and they're doing a lot of work to keep it secure. So I chose that one. It's very mobile friendly. It's got an app on my phone. It's got a plug-in for my browser. Here's another piece. Do not ever save your passwords to your browsers. 
Don't do it, ever. Don't do it. Not to Chrome, not to Internet Explorer, Safari, none of that. Don't do it. But LastPass, it saves it in their little app, in their plugin. And then through encryption, it will put it in the form fields for you. So it's safe. I like it. I like it. Yes? Just an interesting piece of trivia for you, Rodney, and I'm sure you're aware of it, but I'm not sure everybody else. I saw a vendor presentation on all the sensors that are in modern smartphones now, and one of the sensors is monitors your walking, your establishes a profile of how you walk. So you can be identified through that sensor because mm -hmm. um, everybody has a unique walk. Yeah. And on top of that, you know, folks have a, uh, an interesting, interesting perspective on their right to privacy in the United States. If you have a smartphone on you, you, you don't have, the, the privacy is not there. Siri's always listening. Alexa's always listening. Your phone always tracking you. It's, that's part of the digital world. You're giving up those rights of privacy for the convenience of living in 2019 and being able to, I can call my wife saying, hey, you know, Siri, call my wife. Um, so just understand that. You don't have to put everything out there though. Everything, all my young people in school, everything ain't gotta go on social media, okay? Everything ain't gotta go on there. And nothing is private on social media. Nothing's private anywhere you post online. It's all open. It's all open. So just, just keep that with you. I think a lot of you guys are thinking that it's private and nobody's gonna see it. They see all of it. Yes, ma'am. LastPass is a password keeper program. And make sure you turn on two-factor authentication when you set it up, so it sends a code to your device so you can get into your passwords. Go to the website lastpass.com. I never trusted those people. <laughs> well, okay. you know, my friend, uh, Dr. Eric Huffman, um, has a PhD in psychology, but he studies um, the effect of psychology and, and cyber attacks together and why people fall for those kind of attacks. So the trust thing is something he's probably gonna talk about, like we're defaulted to trust people. So there are a lot of bad people out there that take advantage and exploit the fact that we trust right out of the gate. So it's okay to, be, to have a, a heightened sense of things and not trust everything, especially in an online environment because it's different. It's not natural for us to engage in that electrical environment. But he'll, he'll explain that later. It's an awesome, awesome topic. Yes? I just wanted to say I've, I've used LastPass for 10 years and I have about 250 passwords I'm in charge of. And it's the only way I can keep track of the passwords and you can pay for it and they'll give you a free one to try. Mm -hmm. For whatever that's worth, I've used them for 10 years and they've been amazing. Awesome. Thank you for that. It kept me organized. Yep. I love it too. I love it too. Roger, who were you talking about? I was going to talk about. Dr. Eric Huffman. He has a lunchtime. Yes. Yeah, he's awesome. He just did a TED talk, so you can look that up online too. It's awesome. So, firmware. Every network device you have. Every online connected device you have has firmware in it. This is software that is embedded into the hardware of all your devices. So your smart TVs that run Netflix and Amazon Prime and all that, it has firmware. If you haven't updated the software on your TV, you should do it today. You should check that firmware once a month. Unless you have a smartphone, your iPhones will tell you you have a firmware update. Your Android phones will tell you you have a firmware update. Hey, system update, please install now. If you're a gamer like myself, I can't go online and play Mortal Kombat 11 until I put the latest update, firmware update, on my PlayStation 4. I can't play Call of Duty and Destiny 2 until I do the firmware update on my Xbox. If you have a Nest thermostat or Ring doorbell or system like that, it does automatic updates. But for the most part, no other device will do an automatic firmware update for you. If you have a Microsoft Surface system, the Windows updates have firmware updates built in, but that's the only device that'll do that. All the rest of them, you have to go out and find those firmware updates. Those routers that you have in your house that you went and bought from Best Buy and Office Max, and you set them up real quick, and it's like, all right, I got Wi-Fi, it's great. I can get it upstairs, downstairs, I can stream my stuff, and you've never updated the firmware on it since you bought it, they're vulnerable to cyber attacks. Matter of fact, our friends, the Russians, our friends, the Russians, they put, yeah, sure. They launched a cyber attack on routers that had not had the firmware updated since they've been purchased. And we're gonna play that video right now.
The FBI is pleading with Americans to reboot their routers. They're asking anyone with a home or small business internet router to turn them on and then back off again to temporarily stop the spread of malware linked to Russia. But as a local expert tells us, that may not be enough. You've heard about Russian hackers for more than a year now, but this one affects your personal devices. It affects routers that have not been touched since they've been purchased. Ronnie Gillette owns a cybersecurity company in Colorado Springs and is an ethical hacker. He says this malicious software dubbed VPN filter could be destructive. All the information on your network is readable to the attacker, so they're able to capture all the information for every device that's connected to your router, both wired and wireless. And they can take their time and you know, decrypt and disassemble the information and find out personal information about you, websites you visit, passwords you put into your websites to go into them. All that information is up at risk. According to the feds, this virus operates under the guidance of Russia's military intelligence agency. It can stop your router from working and give hackers vital information. Gallet says updating the firmware on your router is really important. Check the internet. It'll check the server for whatever manufacturer got. So it'll check Netgear servers. It'll check Linksys servers for the latest firmware update, and then you'll it'll download it itself and install it. And it only takes like two, three minutes. Save you a world of hurt. And it is estimated that more than 500,000 routers in at least 54 countries have already been compromised. Now, Gillette is recommending you reset all passwords every 90 days anyway to get out in front of any hackers or suspicious activity and avoid being a victim. So for more information about being cyber safe, protecting you and your family, just head to our website at Fox 21. Could you elaborate on uh, the difference between uh, business grade, networking gear versus what you buy at Best Buy? Sure. So um, for those of you that are investing in services that, you know, um, folks in my profession and my colleagues provide, um, we likely won't be going to Best Buy or Office Max to like buy your equipment. So you have consumer grade products and you have enterprise grade business class products. So I only operate in the business class side of the house. And I'm gonna talk about antivirus and all that in the same form. But as in regards to these routers, the enterprise grade products may have automatic update systems built into them. If you are investing in an IT service provider, we're gonna go in and make sure that that firmware gets updated all the time. Um, those devices, at least once a month, you can Google your make and model of your router and be like, how do I update the firmware? And walk you through, you can probably find a YouTube video on how to go in, log in, and find out how to update the firmware on it. You need to do it and check it once a month because it's not doing it on its own. Um, and it's super dangerous. Uh, your network devices, your printers, are another thing. So your printers have firmware in them. When that, that little menu that you press to do your scan to your computer and all that stuff, like all that, there's software in that printer. If I go to the IP address of that printer, it brings up a website. And I can go in and update the firmware through that website. Because if you don't, there are cyber attacks that can be launched through your printers. One of them is called Devil's Ivy. Yeah, it's an awesome name. But it's a nasty infection that can come through your printers. And it affects your security cameras if you have them connected to the same network. It's crazy. So update your TVs. Don't keep your smart TVs on the same network as the rest of your business computers. You should separate all that. I've seen a lot of instances where I walk into businesses and everything's on the network together. All the same. And it should be segmented. And we as professionals know how to segment it. Feel free to go on Google and try to figure out how to segment it yourself. But again, you outsource to a professional so you can save time and spend more time doing what you're good at and making money. Any questions on this firmware slide? Update your firmware. Wireless networks. So I told you about the, uh, the Google Starbucks thing. So I had uh, somebody find me online and call me out of Texas. And they're like, Rodney, I found you online and you know, I've been going to this Starbucks to work for years and I've never had a problem. And you know, today I went in and I uh, got on the wireless network and they asked me for a username and password. And I kept typing in a username and password, like all the ones I could think of, and it wouldn't let me on the Wi-Fi. It's like, you've been compromised. So let me tell you something about the Starbucks Wi-Fi. It doesn't ask you for a username and password. It asks you to accept the user agreement and hit accept and it lets you online. So somebody was able to set up a fake wireless network 
copy that same Starbucks little splash screen that comes up and put a username and password box in it. The guy didn't know. He just kept typing the wrong stuff in. Just kept typing it in, typing it in, typing it in. That's how they get you. That's why they're dangerous. So one of the things me and Tammy were talking about in our, our consult, when she travels, she uses her phone as a hotspot. Right. Do that. Do that whenever possible. Many cellular carriers have a device called, I mean, for Verizon, I'm a Verizon customer, so they call it a jetpack. But it's like a little device, it's not your phone, that you can hook up multiple wireless devices to and create a little network and take it with you wherever you go. It's pocket size. It's awesome. Use that whenever possible. What's but, it called? Uh, in Verizon, they call it a jetpack. Jet. Yeah. Yeah, But just call it a, a wire, yeah, in Verizon, that's what they call it. But all the other carriers, they have a different name for it. Sprint's also in the box. Sprint's called a MiFi. Okay, what's Fox that? Foxfire. Foxfire? One time, $20, unlimited time. Runs on Android phones. I don't know about Apple. It's a... Oh, I remember Foxfire when I had Android back in the day. Right on. I remember that. It was a good app. Um, a lot of the Android phones have a native app in it now that can, that can function the hotspot. Um, but I remember Foxfire. Thanks for bringing that up. Um, so you might run into a scenario where you're like, well, Rodney, I don't have any 4G LTE. There's a Starbucks over there, and I need to get online. What do I do? You need to have what's called a VPN. It's called a virtual private network. And in my professional opinion, there's a right and a wrong way to go about dealing with that. So they have services that you can pay for that provide VPN services. So the VPN will encrypt the connection from your computer to wherever that VPN server sits. So if you're on somebody's public Wi-Fi, once you connect to the public Wi-Fi, engage your VPN, and then all your traffic will be encrypted through that public Wi-Fi. So if anybody's eavesdropping, which a lot of people do on public Wi-Fi's, because um, they're not set up correctly, they won't be able to see your information, right? But the endpoint of that VPN connection may be able to see your information. So there's some untrustworthiness going on with some of those providers of VPN. So I'm a huge fan of creating your own VPN. Make your own, so you know where it's at and you can trust it. So I will give you a device later where you can inexpensively have a VPN server for yourself, for your business. It's inexpensive, it's great. Um, poorly configured guest networks. So you're familiar with guest wireless networks, it's for your guests. And it's usually as far as people think of it. They don't see it any different than any other wireless network except it has guests on it. There's a way it's supposed to be set up. So once I connect to a guest wireless network, and somebody else connects to the same guest wireless network, we shouldn't be able to see each other. It shouldn't be like your local area network at your business where all your computers can see each other and share data. Guest networks aren't supposed to be set up that way. But there are guest networks that are set up that way. I went and did a cyber analysis for a business here in the Springs, and I hopped on their guest network, and um, I was able to see their server with all their data. I was able to see the server that controls all their logins and usernames and passwords, I was able to see all of it from their guests. So their wireless network guy was sitting next to me. He ended up running to the bathroom real quick after I exposed that, and then the wireless turned off magically. So I mean, at least he did something. Yes, sir? How much weight do you put into those programs? I have two, one called Radio Silence and one called Little Snitch, and they tell me everybody that's knocking at the door. And then I think I'm letting in the ones that I should be letting in. But do you put a lot of weight into those? Third-party apps that I don't. Okay. Um, there's a lot of native technology in enterprise wireless network setups that I can control who gets in and who doesn't. And there's several ways to, to get into that. And that's a technical thing. And I'm happy to do a consult with you and talk about talk about those things. Yes. Sir. Just so that everybody knows, that here is being encrypted, and I'm watching everyone's traffic right now. Sure. <laughs> yeah. Fire shark. Yep. So we've got some, so you know, when you have highly technical people in the room, if you ever go to a hacker conference because you're curious, like turn off your Bluetooth and turn off all your wireless stuff. Because <laughs> you'll have, you have folks like that, you know, they can see those things. Um, but that's, this is an ethical individual, but there are unethical individuals that have the same technology. Yeah, I, you know, we, we haven't had coffee yet, but you know, um, I'm assuming you're a good guy. Uh, <laughs> credit card number, I'll, I'll be happy to tell you what it is. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, so hop on your cellular 4G LTE if you could pick it up in this room. I know Verizon picks up pretty good in here. Um, but if you're on a public Wi-Fi, I'm on this Wi-Fi right now, but I'm encrypted. I'm connecting through my VPN. 
So if he's wire sharking me, he's gonna see a whole bunch of garbage. He's not gonna see me. Um, the WPA2 crack of fall 2017. Let me tell you a little story about Wi-Fi. So when it first came out, um, all that information was just exposed and he was able to capture it like he's doing right now. It's all out here in the open. I just capture it and read whatever I want from whatever people are sending over the Wi-Fi. So they had to find a way to encrypt it. The first encryption method was WEP, Wired Equivalency Protocol is what it meant. And it got hacked so we stopped using it. So then they came up with WPA, Wireless Protected Access, version one. It got hacked, stopped using it. So right now we're using WPA2. WPA3 is supposed to be a blockchain tech and I can't wait to see it get used. It sounds amazing, but WPA2 is the gold standard. It's what we're all using right now. Anywhere you're securing wireless. Uh, fall 2017, it got hacked. Okay, so anybody within range of the wireless network was able to get into the network without knowing the password. That was the method for doing it. Um, what do you think the fix was for it? High five for whoever can get it. A firmware update, dude, yes, yes, yes. Man, when that, when that issue made national news, people were going up to, to Netgear and, and, and Cisco, the folks that own Linksys and all that stuff now, and they're like, dude, what, what's the deal? How can WPA2 get hacked? Like, dude, we released a patch for this years ago. But nobody updated their devices, so it never got pushed. It never got installed. So all these, all these routers are wide open. And there are wireless networks wide open to this right now. This was 2017, they're still open. That segment I did on that uh, Russian router issue, people still haven't updated their firmware. There's still people out there vulnerable to this. These are the people that people in my industry are trying to save. We're trying to help them. And because you're here, you know this is a problem, so you're not gonna fall for it. Go tell your people and folks that you work with the same thing and they don't fall for it. Yes, ma'am. Well, so it doesn't say anything WPA2 is bad. It's just that people aren't doing what they're supposed to be doing to keep it good. Correct. Wow. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. A lot of this stuff can be avoided if you're vigilant with it. But if you're not, if you're just, you know, you're a dentist, you're good at, you know, doing root canals and, and dentistry. You're not worried about encryption and updating firmware. You just want to come in, your computer works, and you're good. I went to a dentist's office last year. Every single computer was Windows XP. All of them. All of them. And her husband was doing the IT. He works for like a, a defense firm or something. He's like, yeah, he's good enough. You can come do my stuff. I'm like, that's not, it, that's not what he does. All IT is not the same. Okay, an SEO professional that does websites is not cybersecurity like I do it. It's not the same. Freeze your credit. I have the honor to have been debt free for like two years now. Debt free, dude. Done with debt. It's a slave to the lender, like all, all that. It's the evil thing. It's a whole construct keeping you in debt. I was mad with that last iPhone update, 13, when it came with a credit card app. It's like, dang, man, you put debt in my phone now? Really? Really? I don't do debt. Equifax has a service where they will monitor your stuff for you. They got breached not too long ago. And then I saw their commercial, like, yeah, we'll, we'll go check the dark web, see if your stuff's out there that we leaked. You know, come on, no. Call them individually, lock your credit up with all three of those bureaus. Now, is it a little bit of a pain if you wanna go get a car today? Sure, you might have to wait a couple days to go get your car, okay? But trust me, that little bit of a headache is less of a headache than all three of those bureaus getting compromised with your information. So freeze it. That's my recommendation to you is freeze that stuff. There are services out there that say, well, we'll you just pay us and we'll take care of all of it for all of those. Like, no, 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 just go do it yourself with all three of them. Call them and do it themselves. Do it yourself. Right versus wrong antivirus. No Norton. Not for your business. No Norton. No, no, no Norton. No, no. So Norton is a consumer product from a company called Symantec, it's a German cybersecurity company. They're great. Symantec has an enterprise business class line of products that they name Symantec this, that, and the other. 
Typically, semantic endpoint protection is what you're looking for. You should look for that. Symantec endpoint protection is $54.18 for one year for one computer. And it's great. It's not just an antivirus. If you have an IT company putting an antivirus by itself on your computer, that ain't enough. They're wrong. You should find somebody else. As professionals, we use what's called a unified threat management product. It does more than just antivirus. It does firewalling. It does antivirus protection. It has this other neat trick called intrusion prevention. So you install this software on all your computers, and it kind of turns all your machines into a botnet for your benefit. The computers are looking after each other, they're looking after the network traffic, and it's kind of gauging like how your usage of your data is done on a daily basis. It creates like a baseline. So if there's some kind of nefarious traffic happening on your network that shouldn't be there, it'll stop it. Antivirus won't do that. Your Comcast cable modem won't do that. Your routers won't do that. You have to be looking for that stuff specifically. Unified threat management. No free antivirus. Oh my gosh. Free AVG, free Avast. Like, dude, stop. Stop it. Don't do it. Windows Defender comes with Windows 10. It's not enough. I have seen the papers that there are viruses looking for that product to be installed by itself to destroy it and replace it with something that's going to mess up your computers and all the other computers in your network. Windows Defender is not enough. It's free. It's not enough. You need to pay for something. You want to comment on uh, boxes like watch card boxes? Okay. So um, I'm going to get to that in a minute. Oh, yeah. Okay. Yes. So that, I'm gonna get to that. That's fine. All right, hold me to that. Um, let's see, Ooh, hit the wrong button there. Email security. Stop using free email for your business. Please, please, stop using free email for your business. You have to pay for something and it'll be more secure. So I have seen people using Gmail, Yahoo, AOL, my gosh. So out of all the free ones, it is my professional opinion that Gmail is probably the most secure of the free ones. But they're not secure for your sake. They're secure for their own benefit because they data mine everything you give them. How many of you have read the, the Google Gmail account user agreement? How many of you have read it? Yeah, so they count on that. So in the middle, small print, the whole thing small print, but in the middle they say that we own everything. Your Google Drive, your Google Docs, your email, all of it. So you write your wife and you tell her, hey, I found these cool red bottom shoes on sale. You want them? And you send her that through your Gmail account. You'll see it in Facebook. You'll see it in your Instagram. You start seeing ads on it. You'll see it in your Amazon account because they're all in bed together. They all work together. They all share that data because that data is worth money. It's worth money because they know what you want to shop for. Alexa, she's always listening. Always listening. She's listening to see, hey, babe, I think we're low on milk. Or, hey, I'd like to get some shrimp and have some lobster for dinner. It knows. It wants to know those habits. When did I say it? What do I want? So it can start sending me things. <coughs> uh, Hillary Clinton's email got hacked. Did anybody know that? <laughs> okay. So, still not in jail. Yeah. So, so, so besides that part, I'm, I'm going to stay out the politic piece. But I wanted to use her as an example. Um, when her information came out on WikiLeaks, I took about half a day and I went to WikiLeaks and I read. I wanted to see it. I was like, dude, like how in the world did they get her email? They got it because when I was looking through it, I'm seeing emails getting forwarded and sent back to Yahoo accounts. Every Yahoo account, by the way, is compromised right now by a whole bunch of people. So if you have a Yahoo account and you're running a business on it, all those transactions, all that information is being seen by somebody else all day. Same with AOL. So I'm seeing people sending back and forth emails between AOL, Yahoo, and other free services. If any of those passwords are the same, that's it. I just need to compromise one, and I can get the whole thing. That's what happened. That's an insider threat. That's what got her email done. And somebody just happened to be focused on getting her, and she had that vulnerability there. It'll get you every time. It'll get you guys. Use encrypted email. Virtru, V-I-R-T-R-U dot com is a nice program. You should use it. I'm not big into free stuff, but that one's free for now. Use it. See how it works. If 
you use Office 365, it has native encryption in it. Call their support and be like, hey, how do I encrypt an email using Office 365? It's great. Encrypt your emails. Encrypt them. Don't register personal accounts with business email addresses. I went to a, um, a cyber conference when I first moved here, and um, it, was a, it was a dark web presentation, and they had a whole bunch of military people's email addresses like in the dark web. And I was like, dude, how do they get all these dot .mil like, mess, like, addresses? So you got people registering their Amazon account with their, with their work email or registering their PlayStation Network account with their work email. Yes, okay, so it's going to get compromised. Don't do that. Keep your business for business. Keep your personal for personal. Don't mix. Just like your accounting. Don't mix it. Keep it separate. Yes, sir. Uh, uh, iCloud.com from Apple is free. Is that the same story? As I wouldn't run a business on it. You would. Okay. I would not run a business on it. If you want to use it for your own personal, it's, it's fine. But I wouldn't run a business on it, no. Uh, I did Comcast. Question. Yes, sir. Uh, since encrypted email is, is both software and security based, mm -hmm. how do you help a business that has, I mean, that's great for your internal email, but I mean, how does that work when they're, they're trying to email with other businesses that don't have? I'm glad you brought that up. So he's curious about um, encrypting email to people outside of your organization. So I want to send Vinny an encrypted email. I've sent them to him before. Um, so let me tell you what Virtue does. So Virtue is their free application I was telling you about. Tammy, you're going to be checking it out, right? So um, I sent an email, right? I typed the email up, and there's a button in my, um, my composer to encrypt the email with Virtue, right? And then I send it. You see a little encryption box go, and it gets sent. The person on the other end, no matter where I sent it, will get an email that says, hey, Rodney just sent you this email. It's encrypted. Click this link to open it. Now, if you've been in my class, you'd know that sounds like a class A phishing attack, right? Mm -hmm. Don't, five minutes? All right, thanks. Don't click that email. But when I'm doing encrypted communication, I'm, I'm prefacing it with a phone call. I'm like, hey, I'm about to send you my taxes, or I'm about to send you this information that needs to be protected. I'm about to send you an encrypted email, be on the lookout for it. So then it shows up. They click that link, it authenticates their email, and it shows them the contents. And then within that window, there are secure ways to reply, send attachments back to me, right? So that, it's, it's a lot easier than it used to be. Yeah, definitely no excuse not to be using it anymore. Three minutes, all right, got it. Uh, email scams, phishing emails. Uh, your boss will never ask you to scratch off a whole bunch of them gift cards. And a lot of things about phishing emails are usually urgent and they're usually about money. So before you send any money to anybody over an email, call first. Call first. Tell your people to call first. Use encrypted email. Check the sender. How many real estate people we got in here? Man, your industry is under attack with these emails, boy. They are finding it out. And one of the biggest vulnerabilities I see in your industry is uh, the bring your own device kind of concept that's very heavy in your industry. You have your own laptops that you use to conduct business, but you're all connecting to this main database to like send and receive information. So if I'm able to attack one of your personal computers, guess who owns your database now? I do. And nobody's tracking that. And that bothers me. I'm trying to get in touch with the PPAR people to tell them about that problem. Uh, BBB scam tracker and BBB scam tips. These are crowdsourced um, systems. Yes, sir. I encourage you to shop around and because it's not as unaffordable as you think. Now there are some companies that if you ain't got a million dollars, they don't want to talk to you. I've seen those. But there are companies that are a lot more friendly to their small business. I would highly encourage you to outsource this technology if you don't understand it. If you want to play with it and you want to understand it, go ahead at your own risk. 
but you know, at the end of the day, you want to save money and protect your data so you don't get, get messed up. Um, so this is a three-hour class. I'll be teaching it on the 30th of October at the SBDC office. I highly encourage you to sign up for it. I'll go into in-depth on a lot of these slides that you don't get to see. But in closing, I'd like to leave you with a video that I did my first interview with Fox. They asked me, Rodney, can you do a magic trick? I was like, what do you mean? It's like, well, it's TV. We need something that we can see. I was like, well, maybe I can hack one of your company computers. So they were like, well, it's only a five-minute segment. And I was like, that's going to be plenty of time. Here Many ways that small business owners can protect their information, but often these precautions are not taken, and that's where a lot of hackers jump in and try and steal your information. And here to tell you how to avoid a cyber attack is Rodney from Firma IT Solutions. Thank you for joining us this morning. Hey, thank you for having me. Of course. So to start off, can you just tell us a little bit about some of the vulnerabilities that are out there? Oh, there's a lot of vulnerabilities out there. Mm -hmm. Our small business community is uh, pretty naked um, for the most part as far as protecting themselves adequately from cyber attack. Um, bad password usage, no backups, uh, okay. no encryption on their computer systems. Um, the sky's the limit on it. Free antivirus using free email services to conduct business. Right. Um, it all puts not just the business at risk, but our, our community and yeah. consumers at risk as well. So what can small businesses do to become more secure? Well, you know, um, passwords is a big thing. Uh, there's a lot of different things they can do. Uh, you know, all your passwords should be different okay. for every online account that you have. Really? Uh, Bronco 7 is not a good password. <laughs> um, Probably yeah, not. Yeah, not, not very good at all. Um, back up your data. Uh, there's a lot of education opportunities out there okay. for people to learn how to better protect their businesses from cyber attack. Uh, the Pikes Peak SBDC does a lot of classes. The Better mm -hmm. Business Bureau does classes. Um, Pikes Peak Community College is doing classes. There's a lot of places doing classes. So, so there's no excuse. There's no excuse. There's no excuse for no. you to be getting cyber attacked. All right, so, and you're actually going to show us yes. how easy it really is to be hacked. Yes, yes. So this is a uh, machine from you guys. Okay. Um, got my magic disc here. <laughs> it's got a sad face smile. on yep, it. Yep. You don't want this to happen. Nope, you don't. So there's quite a few vulnerabilities that are present okay. on this machine that allow me to be able to uh, break in. Okay. Um, computers these days don't have to have these vulnerabilities. Uh, the drive encryption is one way to keep yourself from mm -hmm. uh, being attacked the way I'm about to attack this machine. Um, <laughs> Make it sound so scary. It really yeah. is, though. <laughs> <laughs> it is. I mean, it's scary. Like, all of your information, for, especially for a small business owner, mm -hmm. and you have all those competitors out there, if one of your competitors does this, you're done. Like, they've got all your secrets. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Trade secrets are at risk. Um, people's personal information is at risk. Mm -hmm. You know, the laptops is a big, uh, is a big vector for mm -hmm. um, cyber attacks and people losing personal information. There's a lot of organizations that have laptops stolen. Okay. And then the next thing you know, they have to send letters mm -hmm. to all their clients or all their donation base, um, giving them one year of identity theft protection because all right. their data got stolen. Um, this particular method of attack I'm about to use on this machine um, doesn't have to happen to folks. But so what did you just do there? You just So I have a... Uh, I have a CD loaded in here that mm -hmm. has a lot of tools to break into data, break into machines. So I'm using one in particular that helps me crack passwords, uh, find out all the user accounts on a computer. If they're locked accounts, I can unlock them. I can give myself escalated privileges. Wow. And once I have that type of access to a computer, I can just start footprinting and see where I can go from there. So um, crazy. all the accounts on here have passwords on them. And I don't know what they are. But you're going to get in anyways. Yeah, I don't have to know what it is. You wow. can make them as complicated as you want, and I'll still break in in less than four minutes. That's crazy. So, I mean, really all you did is just, all you had to do was put a disk in. Yes. And then this is just all of the, the data on the computer, or what, what is all this? Yes. Yeah, so this is reading what's called the, um, uh, the SAM, the Secure Account Manager in okay. Windows. So it actually goes in and breaks that file apart and allows me to make modifications to it. Wow. So that's what controls your passwords on the computer. That's what controls your user accounts. So I can see a user account here is actually right. stuck on the computer. So I know I'm going to hit that one. But if yeah. I look, there's actually um, it's actually four accounts, an administrator account uh, and three other accounts here. And the administrator account is uh, disabled. But yeah. I unlocked it when I was in the back, back there. Wow. So I'll be able to uh, hop You'll be in able there. To get right oh, in. yeah. Oh, yeah. All right. So we're, we're almost out of time here. Okay. But just can you 
tell me where can people get in contact with you to have you help them out? Oh yeah, so 719-377-6603. Uh, we perform uh, free cybersecurity analyses for small businesses just so they know where they stand as far as their cybersecurity protection and we can give them a way forward from there. Wow. Uh, www.firmaitss.com. Perfect. Yes, ma'am. All right, Thank and you. it looks like it's starting back up and yes. you're about to get right in there. Yeah, about to just log in with no password and, and hop right in. That is crazy. Yes, well, you do is. not want this to happen to you guys out there. No, and I it mean, doesn't he, have to. Yeah, it doesn't have to. So mm -hmm. if you want to find out more about Firma IT Solutions, go to www.firmaitss.com.